hyperlipidemic drugs are going to be very important in the management of patients with atherosclerosis. Of course, these folks are associated with hypercholesterolemia and an increased risk of cardiovascular and cerebrovascular diseases. Our overall goal? To decrease LDL cholesterol and to decrease plaque formation. And we have a number of drugs to choose from. This figure does a nice job of illustrating the site of action of several of our antihyperlipidemic drugs. The site of action ranges from the GI tract, which is where drugs like cholestyramine or cholestopol are going to work. The zetamibe also works in the GI tract. The liver itself, where statins are going to inhibit the enzyme HMG-CoA reductase, blocking the conversion of HMG-CoA into mevalonic acid. Niacin, and to some extent the statins, are also going to inhibit VLDL synthesis. And then we have drugs like gem fibrozil and the fibrates, which inhibit the enzyme lipoprotein lipase. So a number of targets for these drugs. There's no doubt about it that the most important of the lipid-lowering drugs are the statins. These are HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors, and the prototypes are atorvastatin and rosuvastatin. There are several others that are still available, but these have become the two most popular. Simvastatin is also one that you probably know and is still used quite heavily. At their highest doses, atorvastatin and rosuvastatin are considered high-intensity statins and they have the ability to lower LDLs by 50%. Now we can use lower doses of statins, and we classify those as low or moderate intensity. So these have become very, very popular drugs and popular strategies to be more aggressive at controlling patients' total cholesterol and also to try and improve their cardiovascular outcomes. By inhibiting HMG-CoA reductase, you're going to decrease liver cholesterol you're going to increase LDL receptor expression. LDL, of course, when you get the LDL receptors upregulated, you can pull more LDL out of the plasma. You also see a decrease in VLDL synthesis that results in decreased triglycerides. The side effects of the statins make for very popular test questions. Certainly muscle pain, myalgia, is one of the most commonly observed side effects. Rarely, you're going to see more severe muscle damage that results in rhabdomyolysis. In fact, the scenario where you're likely to see rhabdomyolysis, the patient is on a high dose of the statin, and they're probably on a second drug that can also cause rhabdomyolysis. We check creatine kinase levels as an indicator of muscle toxicity, and we do regular liver function tests as an indication of whether or not these drugs are affecting the liver. Historically, the drug gemfibrozil, when combined with a statin, is going to increase the risk of rhabdomyolysis. It's one of the reasons why gemfibrozil has become much less popular today as a choice for treating patients with hyperlipidemias. The drug is part of a group known as fibrates, and we'll see them in a few slides, but we have some newer members with a much lower risk of interacting with statins and causing muscle damage. We also have to watch out for patients who are on statins and at the same time taking a drug that's a P450 inhibitor. Watch out for the grapefruit juice question. We covered this back in general principles. Grapefruit juice contains components that inhibit drug metabolism. So whether it's eating grapefruits or drinking the grapefruit juice, you can raise the levels of the statin, increasing their risk of perhaps muscle pain. Macrolides especially erythro and clarithromycin, and protease inhibitors also have P450 inhibitor effects, raising the levels of statins, perhaps increasing their side effects. There's a note in the margin about non-statin drugs, which have not been shown to improve cardiovascular outcomes when added to statin therapy. These drugs are most often used in patients who cannot tolerate a statin. So to say that another way, today, a patient is most likely to be put on varying levels of a statin all by itself. And if at their highest doses the patient cannot tolerate the statin, we look for alternatives, which we're going to explore in the next several slides. The group of drugs known as bile acid sequestrants includes cholestyramine and cholestopol. And just like their name says, they complex with bile salts. Remember that bile salts 
are routinely recycled in the body. Probably about 95% of your bile salts get recycled. So the action of drugs like cholestyramine or cholestipol is to bind the bile salt and break that recycling. So as a result, the liver is going to have to synthesize more bile salts. In order to do that, you're going to see an increase in LDL receptor expression so that you can pull LDL out of the blood. The liver has to make more bile salts and that lowers total cholesterol. Unfortunately, when you're taking a bile acid sequestrant, you start to make more bile salts, but the liver also increases its production of VLDLs and triglycerides. That's the big problem. Bile acid sequestrants increase the levels of triglycerides. And we'll see in a moment that that's a reason why you don't ever want to use these drugs if the patient already has elevated triglycerides. They work in the gut, so GI disturbances are a problem. But more specifically, it's their ability to inhibit the absorption of lipid-soluble vitamins that can be a big problem. So vitamins A, D, E, and K, their absorption is going to be decreased while you're taking a bile acid sequestrant. Because these drugs are going to affect the concentration of bile salts, they also affect the absorption of various orally administered drugs, including warfarin, thiazide diuretics, and digoxin. I don't see a great test question with any of those, but certainly you can affect absorption when you're using a bile acid sequestrant. I do see a test question related to the fact that you don't use these drugs in patients with elevated triglycerides. Our next drug is niacin, also known as vitamin B3. Niacin is going to inhibit VLDL synthesis and does a great job of decreasing plasma VLDL, LDLs, and may be the best for raising plasma HDLs. Unfortunately, niacin is what I call a, a good drug with a bad reputation. It has some side effects that are annoying and many times are reasons why folks don't want to use this drug. Niacin can cause flushing, puritis, and rashes. And we can prevent those things by pretreating with aspirin or another NSAID like ibuprofen. Because NSAIDs prevent these side effects. It must mean that those side effects, flushing, itching, and rashes, are prostaglandin-mediated. And that's key for you to know. These are prostaglandin-mediated side effects. There is some concern about long-term use and hepatotoxicity with this drug and also possible hyperglycemia, so a real problem in your diabetic patient. Our next group of drugs are the fibrates. Jim Fibrazil is the classic prototype of this group, but today, phenofibrate has become the most popular drug. These are drugs that bind to the PPAR alpha. That's the peroxisome proliferator activated receptor. The PPAR pathway is a gene expression pathway. So when the fibrates bind to this receptor, they're going to increase the expression of lipoprotein lipases. And that's the key. With enhanced lipoprotein lipase activity, these drugs do a great job of lowering the levels of triglycerides. You'll notice that I've highlighted their use in hypertriglyceridemia. In fact, if we take a step back and we do a comparison thinking about triglycerides, if you diagnose a patient with elevated triglycerides, you have one group of drugs that will definitely be beneficial. That's the fibrase. And then you have one group of drugs you definitely want to avoid, and that's your bile acid sequestrants. Generally, fibrates are well tolerated, but side effects like gallstones or mild muscle pain could occur. The last of our lipid-lowering drugs is azetamide. This is a drug that works in the gut to prevent intestinal absorption of cholesterol. It effectively lowers LDLs, but it's most commonly used together with a statin. Because it works in the GI tract and affects absorption, it can cause GI distress. We have a summary of antihyperlipidemic uses. Certainly when I think about my lipid-lowering drugs, statins are our favorites. They're the ones that are most commonly used. If you have a patient who only has elevated triglycerides, if elevated triglycerides are their problem, most often we start that patient on a fibrate. But if they have high triglycerides and high cholesterol, most often we go with statins. We also include the drug Orlistat in this chapter. 
While Orlistat is not specifically used for its lipid-lowering properties, it's a drug that's actually used for weight loss. It seems to fit appropriately enough into this chapter. The drug actually works by inhibiting pancreatic lipase and decreasing triglyceride breakdown in the intestine. Watch out for this drug on your exam. You may know that this drug goes by the trade name of Ally. It's available by prescription, available over the counter as well. People take it for weight loss, but of course, because this drug blocks the absorption of fat, of course, the side effect of steatorrhea, fatty stools can occur. It also will affect the absorption of lipid-soluble vitamins, so vitamins like A, D, E, and K will be reduced in their absorption. We recommend that patients who take Orlistat always take a vitamin supplement, and you take that supplement at least two hours apart from your dose of this drug. Now that we have finished chapters 5 and 6, let's do three practice questions together. Here's the first one. Pause the video and try the question, and then we will discuss. A 63-year-old woman has chest pain while climbing the stairs of her office building. She sits down and takes some medication, after which she is able to continue. Which of the following is the mechanism of action of the drug? Well, do you recognize the condition? Chest pain on exertion. We'd love to have people climb stairs to let folks know that this person has stable angina. She sits down and takes some medication to promptly relieve this attack, so she takes sublingual nitroglycerin. The question then becomes, how do nitrates work? Nitrates are very effective venodilators. They're going to decrease preload. Choice B is the correct answer. Here's question number two. Pause the video and review the question, and then we will discuss. A patient with a history of migraine headaches is started on a preventative medication. Soon after therapy has begun, the patient experiences crushing chest pain and ECG shows myocardial ischemia. Studies in the cath lab indicate episodes of coronary vasospasm. Which drug below likely cause the ischemia and angina? You might think that this question is out of place related to the chapters we just covered, but not really because you might remember that there are a number of possibilities for preventing migraines. In this case, this is going to be a drug that actually can cause vasospasm. The problem here is if you take the most popular drug that's a preventative for migraines, propranolol. Propranolol is the non-selective beta blocker. By blocking beta-2s, you actually vasoconstrict. It's to remind us that we never use beta blockers in patients with vasospastic disorders because the drug can actually cause vasospasm. Other options listed here, like sumatriptan, is a great drug for acute migraine attacks, okay, and it is a potent vasoconstrictor. Others, like valproic acid and amitriptyline, are not likely to cause coronary vasospasm, and verapamil, calcium channel blocker, also not likely to cause a vasospasm. Here's question number three. Pause the video, review the question, and then we will discuss. A 67-year-old patient complains of muscle aches and pains and tenderness affecting the legs and trunk. There's myoglobinuria, a significant fall in creatinine clearance, and a rise in serum creatinine kinase levels to nearly 10 times the upper limit of normal. Which drug below likely caused these effects? Well, muscle pain, muscle toxicity, are consistent with the actions of statins. So rosuvastatin, choice E, for hypercholesterolemia. Think about mild muscle pain most often, though it could be more severe, and the levels of creatine kinase could be an indicator of muscle toxicity.